All right. Well, welcome everybody. Um, maybe before I get started, so this um, I, this topic for this talk, I realize just how ambitious it is and kind of um, how imperfect of a problem space that is. So um, I'm going to do my best to cover this area. But as I mentioned, uh, as I'm mentioning now, is that you know it's a little bit of a, of a trap. So I wanted people to to get. Um, the title and kind of want to come in the room to, to learn about this topic, but at the same time, um, I will not provide all the answers. Uh, and my goal here is to really explore the problem space of change management and data and to give a few pointers to a few solutions. Um, you might think I, I'm coming here like I've done change management right at a bunch of companies and we figured it out. Actually, that's not the case. Like in, in the, the companies I worked at before were pretty, um, unhappy with the way we did change management and data. Um, and I think there's, that's an area where data engineering has still a lot of grounds to cover uh, compared to software engineering. Like if you look at CI, CD and how developed it is in, um, in software engineering and kind of what we do in data, there's quite of a gap to fill. Um, so I got the intro already. Um, maybe the, I wanted to show this, uh, this T-shirt, which is like the OG Airflow T-shirt. So I, I made a batch of, like, I believe, 10 of these T-shirts super early on at Airbnb. So it was in 2014. Um, there's probably a lot to say about how Airflow got created. I think there's been some talks in the past of like the, the early days, but, uh, but really was unambitious projects at the beginning. So it's really awesome to be here and see what it has become and uh, clearly would not have become much of anything if it wasn't for all the people in the community and all the users and um, you know it takes an army and we are now an army which is great um, a little bit more about superset so we so you know part of the reason why I, I faded at some point of the the airflow community was to go to the superset community and create this whole uh, uh, community around Apache superset so Apache superset is a business intelligence solution it's in the data visualization space. So it's very much a competitive tool to the Tableau and Looker of the world, but it is fully open source and, and fully amazing um, and has been evolving for quite some time. So if you have not checked out, and that's like the little um, ad commercial portion of this, of this talk, I'm going to keep it very short. But if you have not checked out Apache Superset um, ever or recently, you should really check it out. It has gotten really good. And there's no reason why you shouldn't be using open source for your business intelligence uh, solutions. I urge you to check it out. And the best way to check it out is on Preset. So Preset is a hosted service for Apache Superset. So if you want to check out Superset and how far it has gotten. But yeah, so ch check out Superset. It's, it's amazing. There's some really good um, you know, APIs, SDK for it. It's super mature. Um, it, it works super well. And you, you can try it on Preset. And if you decide you like it, you can you know, stay on preset or run it uh, from open source too. So very much a fully open source solution. So change management in data is extremely hard and, and we probably all suck at it in, in, in very intricate ways. Um, I hate slides like this one that, show, that have a lot of words on them, but I wanted to make the slide painful because the space we're exploring is actually painful. Um, and then I'll go through some of these, but I think you're familiar with some of these problems, like why is change management and data hard? So first, um, with the advent of the modern data stack and even before the modern data stack, we have very complex stacks and ecosystem, right? So you have a, a bunch of tools, you have, uh, you're have you probably using you know, Fivetran, DBT, Airflow, um, and a million other things. You probably have like more than one BI tool in your organization. And all these tools are somewhat opinionated as to how you should do change management. It's hard to coordinate and orchestrate around, around all of this. Uh, there's often a lack of clear lineage and contracts. I believe a, 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 fr a friend of mine is giving a talk about lineage in a different room, uh, but stay in this room or maybe you want to go to that other room to see what they're talking about. But um, here, you know, you change something in data and you don't, Maybe you're afraid and you're a little bit constipated in making changes because you're afraid of, of what you might break down, uh, down, down the downstream, right? So that's always a challenge. Uh, there's no explicit contract to, so you don't know if what you change is going to break something. You might say, like, well, I'm going to remove this column. It should be safe. No one should be using it. But maybe there's you know, 10, thing, 10 things that are using this column. Um, there's... A spectrum of criticality. I think that's, that is very different from software engineering. 
Um, there's a bunch of stuff in your data warehouse or in your Airflow DAGs that are not that important, right? Like that's, and that's not as true in software engineering. Like if you have a microservice architecture, you have a service, all services are mission critical or, you know, there's, a, there's still a spectrum of criti criticality on both sides, but I think in data, more than elsewhere, um, there is much more of that, right? There's some little dashboards that no one uses anymore and no, no one will ever use. There's some little pipelines that are just not as important as others. So that doesn't, it might not make sense to be super rigorous across the board, right? So maybe you're coming to this talk like, oh yeah, well, I want a super rigorous like way to do change management. I'm gonna apply it across the board in my company. And actually that might not make sense, right? There's a bunch of things that don't, should not require all the friction that comes with a lot of rigor. Um, DDL, DML complexity, I won't get too much into that, but like the data definition language and a data modification type of thing. So as you do change management, you gotta create new columns, delete columns, create new tables, and figure out what you're gonna do with these new columns and, and prime them and backfill them, and that's complicated. Um, data scale, speedy cost, we cannot afford, it's easy to, to, to spin off a service, like a staging version of a service. Uh, maybe it's not that easy, but it's easier to be like, I'm gonna spin off like a staging service, uh, like three version of my service for dev and staging. In data, you can't really afford to have, um, you know, a full clone of your production data warehouse and staging. So um, the cost there are, is just expensive to do so in terms of storage and compute. And, uh, and you know, it's also, it might take a long time to run things in, in dev and staging, it's expensive. So. We can't really afford to do that, or at least historically, that was the thinking around it. And then um, data access policy is often an afterthought. I'm, I'm, it's somewhat related to all this, but not as critical, maybe. So that's what I was saying. As people enter the room, I think I did a check as to how many people I've seen. This talk that I gave from my backyard um, two years ago when it was the Distributed Airflow Summit 2021. And this talk is building up, so somehow, I wanna talk about <laughs> a topic that is not that interesting to me, but I think is important. So I think that's the reason why I've been talking about operating context and um, managing data pipelines in different environment. I think the reason why I'm talking about that again is because it, it's kind of a gaping hole in, in Airflow. Maybe I'm like, I have some guilt of like when I started Airflow, I forgot to address the fact that people work with different um, environments or um, operating contexts. Or, not that I forgot, I just kind of led that problem to the people who uh, are writing their DAGs to do that. So now I'm like, I, I should probably tell people um, or you know, share about how, um, how to manage DAGs in different contexts. And the reason why I decided to call this operating context and not environments is because they're not really environments. There's a lot of needs for um, operating your DAGs in different contexts. These contexts may or may not be dev staging, prod, and beyond, right? I think what we need in data is not as clearly labeled as that, and I'll talk about that. So a big portion of this talk is gonna be about revisiting the concept of operating contexts um, and, and what they are and how to implement them and, and why you, know, you might wanna use this pattern. And then I'll talk about more about like mappings, what to do in terms of like CI, CD um, and data. All right, so what are operating contexts? It is not an Airflow concept. Like in here, when I gave this talk two years ago, I was like, oh, maybe we should elevate that in the Airflow information architecture to have a native, to bring this concept as like a native concept. Um, who here uses DBT here and there? Like, all right, so there's a notion of target in DBT that you can define. Like typically a target will be prod dev staging. Um, I thought it, it would be good to elevate a, a similar concept of target or, or operating context in Airflow. Um, it doesn't have to be an Airflow concept, it can just be something that's in your DAGs, right? Like you can just implement your own operating, and that's what I'm gonna talk about today. Um, you could call that, like, call that a parameterizable, parameterized, I, I can't pronounce this, uh, DAGs with parameters, it's probably uh, target mode, DAG modifiers, or other ways you can kind of think of these ideas. Actually, you, you probably have that already. If you're an advanced uh, kind of data team and you write a bunch of Airflow, you probably have already these things that say a DAG if you're in this context, you know, operate slightly differently. But um, I, I, I wrote like a concise definition, which is what is an operating context? It is a declared mode of operation for a DAG. Um, it alters the, the DAG's shape or behavior in a, in a clearly stated way. Um, so that means if I'm in dev, I wanna operate on sample data. If I'm in staging, I want to 
source from the production staging area and run stuff, right? So those are um, things that I, I think are better clearly uh, labeled and declared. So some examples of where you might want to use these DAG parameters is defining different environments, but then it's not limited to that. You might want to create different operating context for your DAG of like, hey, you're, hey DAG, you're in a backfill mode right now, operate in a different way. Or a hey, DAG, you're in my dev environment, you don't need to be processing petabytes of data, right? So those are some of these ideas. In terms of like how you would implement this stuff, so instead of writing just like DAG, you know, from Airflow import DAG and then and by the way, I don't know if the API still looks the same way as it did when I wrote it originally, but from Airflow import DAG and then say, uh, you know, lower cap DAG is equal to instantiate my DAG with a DAG ID, um, you might write a function that returns a DAG object instead. And this is like a, a nice like function signature. So you write a get DAG function that receives very explicit input parameters. Namely here in this specific context, I say it receives an operating context as either prod dev staging, default of prod, and then here it's like, oh, I'm gonna create a, a fast mode too. And then that becomes a little bit like the interface for your DAG you know, or for your, really it's not a DAG anymore, it is a DAG factory or a DAG generating function, right? Um, so simple example too, like, of like how do you kind of parameterize that? Like environment variable, so you see for the, the, the Python uh, literate in this crowd, which I assume is, is pretty high uh, literacy rate in Python, but os.environ is a way to get an, envir an environment variable. Um, and in this case, I'm getting some sort of operating context that exists from probably like the CI CD pipeline kind of sets that up for me. Um, and here I'm doing something really simple, which is like I'm gonna modify the default arguments for the pipeline and I say like, well, in dev don't do retries. We don't need to do retries in dev, this is not production. Um, <clears throat> so this is showing like, sorry, the, the hook of the kind of stuff uh, you might want to hook to an operating context, but there's a bunch of injection points and I'll talk about some of the patterns of like how you're, you'd be able to read that context and um, operate in a slightly different way. So pattern number one would be um, changing your connections. So here I'm doing some pre something pretty simple, which is if you're in dev, use different connection IDs, right? So that's a way that you can segment and isolate your environment, so as you will say, um, if you're in dev, don't use the connection ID for production, use the connection ID for dev. And then you can have like some pretty solid isolation doing that, though there are some, some clear like crossover pattern. There's a question of like, wait, now they're very isolated. Like how do I get some good data into staging to work on? Um, we'll talk about that, but you, you can kind of get creative around how to do that and do that well. Pattern two, so schema mapping. So maybe you have on a single data warehouse and um, you might have different schema names. You might have, I think at Airbnb would have like just one big presto thing and then we'd say there's the core schema but there would be core dev and core staging. And here we're essentially creating these parameters that will become like DAG level parameters that are accessible in all tasks. And then here I'll be able to point to different schemas depending on the environment I'm operating in, right? So the patterns here are pretty simple. Like what environment am, am I in and what should I change? Um, there's this pattern of crossover that we've used quite a bit in places before, which is I want to test my compute in staging, but I want to use production data as the source. So it's it, yeah, here you do this crossover pattern where you have a prod environment that has, you know, so say here, a, a, it's a very simple linear DAG, like data set one, two, three. But in this specific case, what I want to do is like, hey, when I run this job, I want it to, to read production data and to output in a staging environment where I can test it. So it's like crossover. It's definitely like uh, if there was like real software engineers in the room, they could you know, come to the stage and slap me and be like, yeah, you don't want to isolate your environments. But the reality is in data, you can't really afford to have all your data places. So um, that's a little bit of a hack that, um, that you can play with. The way you would do that is your instrument, your source and destination in a different way. And um, yeah, it's, it's pretty easy to do, you know, I, I won't get into like the code level of it, but you know, this talks about the pattern. Here, if you're in a dev environment, uh, you wanna run things like kind of cheap, um, adding some sort of sampling, maybe upstream. So maybe you have a pipeline that sources from your staging area and um, limits the data. So here's a very kind of dumb way to do it, to say like limit 100 rows, but you might want to say like limit 1% of the hash of the user ID or something like that, do something smaller so that 
In dev, you're operating on sample data. It's still maybe production data from the staging area, but it's a subset of it. All right, so those are some of the concepts. Uh, wait, there's more here. Fixtures as a source data set. That's another pattern, maybe in the dev environment, instead of a, you know, the concept of fixture comes from software engineering. It's just like you have your kind of test data as part of your unit test, so you might want to do that too. So your dev environment or staging environment might have a predefined subset, so maybe a very small version of the staging area that's static, deterministic, doesn't change over time, and hopefully representative of what's happening in production. All right, so this is the portion of this talk that is new, and I should have an eye on the clock. I'll just get my phone to make sure I'm not. Good. I'm good. I've got another, what, 10 minutes? Eight, Eight minutes, thank you. Um, so, so this is more new, so here I wanted to get into like, oh wait, how, you know, if you want to release stuff in production without, you know, say, say if, if a constraint in your environment is your data engineers should not be able to touch production, the only thing that should touch production is CI, CD, then, um, you know, how would we do that? By the way, that's the way we do it in software engineering. Like, you don't want, you know, you don't want people to be touching at production ever in whatever it means. Like, most engineers won't have access to the production environment. The only way you can touch production is by merging something in a PR and then CI CD has access to production and does the stuff. All right, so I did, I did the mind binding, the, the mind thing of like, okay, what's your typical CI CD pipeline? What's in there? And then how does it map from, um, from software engineering to data engineering? Um, and here I use Midjourney to generate these lovely images at the, at the bottom. Um, all right, so the build phase, so, you know, compiling your software is typically not something you have to do really in, uh, in the Python Airflow world. But you could say, A, you might want to do some sort of uh, reprocessing the downstream dependency. And in some ways, like when you think about a compiler and what it does, it's like it, it ch figures out which files need to be rebuilt and then it rebuilds all the files that depends on that file. So here, you know, part of what you do in data engineering CI CD is trigger the downstream stuff that what you change, right? So if you change a pipeline X and there's three downstream dependencies, you need to reprocess X and the downstream dependencies. So that's part of CI CD pipeline, unless you're lazy and you kind of want to reprocess the whole day worth of data or whatever it is. So, uh, but here's something that needs to happen. Um, database migrations. So that's, I, I have a slide on that. It's kind of brutal, um, but I'll, we'll talk about that some more, but that's like essentially like DDL, DML, alter table, add column, update table, you know, set columns equal to default value, whatever it is. Um, there is also unit tests, so this would probably be like, the equivalent would be data quality tests and assertions, or some good libraries to do that, or you can write your own um, in Airflow. A lot of people do that. Um, Backend deployment is a little bit like deploying your pipeline. You're deploying your DAGs and code where the Airflow scheduler is going to see see those. Um, that's that's a mapping and equivalent. Then front end builds and push to CDN. That's where I think it's kind of interesting. This to me maps to um, BI tool synchronization. So that means that um, somewhere in your in your data pipeline, I'm interested to talk about that a little bit more in a minute or less. Is um, if you modify your logic, your, your DAG, and you want to modify your data set, then presumably you also want to modify your dashboards, right? And be really great if your CI CD pipeline will um, push all these things atomically-ish and keep them in sync. And then, you know, some, sometimes like you see manual evaluation and staging and some sort of like last phase approval and staging. So I think that translates to the exact same thing. Right? <laughs> so you might go and run some, uh, Dashboard, make sure they look good um, in staging, and if they do look good, um, give the um, give the okay, the manual okay, to let this stuff um, execute in production. Database migration, um, DDL, DML, so that is that can be really painful to manage, and actually the toolkits that exist, um, not like here I have the 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 logo for Alembic, that's SQL Alchemy's Alembic, that they offer a database migration service that people t t typically use and apps. Um, but that can be pretty tricky to do, but that, that is a path to solution where if, you know, not only you need to migrate your new code, but you need to do the migration code, right? So you need to run that alter table, add column. So if you're creating a new column to a pipeline, you need to run that somewhere in production or close to production, or you need to somewhere 
rebuild that, that table in a, in a full refresh fashion. Um, and you can do that with things like Alembic. Or, or people do build their own solutions to do that to say, along with this pull request, you should run this one-off script um, as part of the CI CD. Right, so this will look like, um, yeah, I, I, I'm adding a table, I wanna run a custom backfill, I add a new column, I wanna set a value for it. Um, this is a one-off script that, go, that is attached to your pull request that you should merge and there's different ways to do that. Um, and Alembic is one way to do it, but it doesn't work super well for large teams. I've seen people more do their, um, their custom own framework. Uh, home script migration, simple script, uh, that's the kind of homegrown way of doing that. Uh, BI, viz, and apps. So here, um, the first thing I want to say is like in general, like forward comp compatibility is a really great thing, but it's a really great thing between your pipelines and your BI tool. So that means um, adding a column is great, and then keeping the old column maybe that I was using before is also great, as opposed to if you go and start to do destructive changes, then you're gonna have a dashboard somewhere that's gonna try to use a data set that is incompatible and won't work. So I think in general, it's, um, it, it's best practice to do mostly forward compatible um, changes on a daily basis, and maybe you accumulate some sort of things and cleanups that you need to deprecate in a batch down the line that will create downtime or uh, mayhem in your in your systems. So that means like be cautious around um, be cautious around like doing uh, backward or forward and compatible changes in your pipeline because you're going to break stuff. And a good way to do that is to not do that and to accumulate dirt over time. Um, yeah, and then uh, something that's a little bit sad is like uh, here, you know, the title of the talk is about change management across tools in the ecosystem, and that includes BI, but a lot of BI tools out there uh, don't have really good support for managing assets as code. And unfortunately, that means that you cannot really do CI, CD with those tools. So if you use, um, you know, if you use Looker, you're probably okay, but if you use Tableau, you're kind of screwed. You, I don't think there's a really good way to, to say like, hey, Tableau, migrate this dashboard into production. Uh, fortunately, there are some really good ways to do that with superset. So I, I told you before I work on superset. Uh, so people call it uh, people call it um, headless BI. So in superset and in preset, it's really easy to export and import um, your assets as code. So that means as part of your pipeline or as part of your pull request, you might change a data set, have a migration script for that new data set, and then have a new version of the dashboard and all these things when CI CD kicks in, is gonna say, all right, now run, you know, deploy this new, this new data asset, run, uh, run the database migration, and then up, update or create this new dashboard in production, like update the new version of the dashboard that fits with, um, that, that fits with, uh, with, with the pipeline and the changes that, you know, so you can have a single repo and all these things can go together. Um, I believe that's the end. So I've got my, my conclusion. I'm surprised that I'm, I fit in the 25 minutes because I did not really rehearse this talk. I didn't know how long it was going to take, but uh, somehow it worked out. So conclusion, change management is in data is really hard. Um, you probably haven't figured it out. I haven't figured it out. Uh, hopefully the, a few pointers here are helping. Um, just be rigorous where rigor is needed. Like you don't need to have like, you know, four environments, five environments for all of your stuff. So some pipelines and are much much more uh, mission critical than others. So for those, you know, uh, have more rigor and have less rigor, we, we don't need it. And then find the right pattern that works for you. Luckily, like Airflow is like super hackable, so you can do whatever, pretty much whatever the heck you want. And then uh, as always, like get creative and, and break the rules. Uh, they're made to be broken. So that's what I got. That's all, folks. Amazing. Thank you so much, Maxime.